This is the Swedish Maritime Museum. They have inside the most extraordinary collection of objects that tell Sweden's wonderful maritime story. They've been collecting ever since this building was purpose-built in 1938. And among their 50,000 objects and artifacts are some of the world's best ship models. And we're here to film them. So let's go inside and see what we're up to. We're down in the basement, surrounded by all of the kit we've had to bring in to be able to film these models. It requires so much equipment. This is the Argentina, it's the first model that we're filming out of four, so we've got this one and then three more to go. It's an incredibly detailed model, shows the storage layout of this vessel which used to sail from Sweden all the way to South America. We're going to use incredibly close-up technical lenses which will allow us to see this model in incredible detail, play with the light and see if we can make the model come alive. We're going to go like left to right. So it's a vessel, the Argentina, from the Johnson line. And they were real pioneers in seafaring, long distance trade. This was a vessel which traveled regularly from Sweden down to Belgium and on to South America through the Panama Canal and to the west coast of, of both North and South America. The Johnson line was founded by a guy called Axel Johnson. He went on to become one of the 20th century's true pioneers, a real, a real trade magnet. And he always maintained his company's superiority by maintaining a competitive technological edge. And if you look at this ship, you can see just how extraordinarily efficient it was. Every bit of it is crammed full of cargo. You've got a diesel engine and a very small, very noticeable fuel tank. And it's so different to the steamships of the generation before and all of their holds were full of the coal that you needed to power the ship. But this one is just stuffed with goods that you can bring back Back to Europe and he can sell and make an absolute fortune. This is obviously just one of many, many ship models they have here. This place is a treasure trove. So let's go see if we can find some more. I love being behind the scenes in a museum. There's always great stuff going on behind doors. The reason we've come to this fabulous museum in Stockholm is that they have one of the best collections of ship models in all of Europe, and these are the finest of them. Look at this one, this is my favourite. This is one of a series of vessels built in the 18th century that were known as archipelago frigates. They were designed specifically for use in the Baltic. Surrounded by enemies, Sweden, very concerned about Russian naval power in particular, but also quite an aggressive country at the time. They used these vessels to project their sea power. It was actually part of the army rather than a part of the navy. These ships were designed by a Swedish naval architect called Frederick Henrik Aff Chapman, and he is credited as being the father of naval architecture. You can see why these would have been such a threat, because they combine incredible power. You see all of the guns there, but also with mobility. You don't need wind, you've got your men. A really terrifying weapon of war. This is unique because of the guns on the centre line of the vessel. I have no idea how they managed to operate them without shooting their own masts off, but it was a novel solution to a particular problem, and that is how you manage to load armaments onto a galley. Now this is an exquisite model as well, 17th century Swedish model. One of the great things about it is it's got a completely, perfectly fitted out interior. I think the ship modelers made it as a sort of gift to themselves that they know what's inside but no one else does. It would be good to get a flexible camera and actually have a look inside this one. 
very common with ship models, actually, to have one side exposed. And the one we're filming downstairs, the Argentina, does that. But this is a, the 18th century sailing warship, and it allows you to look at the complexity of the construction. It took maybe a thousand trees to build something this big. You can see how the masts are stepped right down to the keel. Wonderful work of art. <laughs> they just get, keep getting bigger and bigger. Look at this one. Models like these were used for education purposes, also used for decoration, but every one of them can tell you something important about changing maritime technology innovation over the years. And then this one tells a fabulous story about how do you get aircraft onto a ship? How do you launch them from a ship? How do you recover them once they've flown? Here you can see these planes, their wings folded away, and a complex catapult type system which was used to launch them. This is the Gotland from 1933. But as soon as you can put a plane on a ship, it allows you to do all sorts of things. It's not just about projecting power. You can use them for scientific research. You can use them to help understand the world in which we live. So this is actually a key moment in, in our understanding of the history of the world. Now, one of the truly fantastic things about this museum is they actually have their own model workshop and they've been building models and repairing models ever since this place was built in the 30s. Come on. Now, here we are. Hello, Stefan. Hi. How are you doing? Stefan is the professional model maker here. He's been here since 1986 and he looks after the models. This is an East Indiaman we'll be filming in the main studio a little later on today, but it gives us a chance to have a look around. I love this little light ship one up in the corner. This is for making rope. Can you show us how this works? This is so cool. For me, my own bit of a uh, miniature rope, handmade by Stefan. Thank you very much. This is cool. All the different sizes. It's fantastic. And you think rope is rope, but of course it isn't. There are so many different types you need. Every bit of the rigging has something different, something that requires a bit of special attention. Look at this. I love all the miniature tools that they create for making these models. In fact, I know a model maker back in the UK who, um, started to make a model, but before he actually did anything, he spent six months grinding needles into tools. So fine was the detail of his craftsmanship. But if you want to see a proper tool cabinet, come and look at this. It's a treasure trove of model making. Would you look at this? There are 300 tools in here and it's got everything you could possibly want to make a ship in miniature. It was owned by a guy called Hugo Ackermark and he made 14 models here. He was a naval engineer and he left this to the museum. It's the most wonderful thing. It is remarkable, but it does make you wonder exactly how many hammers you really need. This is so exciting, it's a very special moment. This model is one of the oldest ship models, certainly I've ever seen, it's one of the oldest in the world. It's from 1590 and it was a votive ship model. They're the kind of models that were hung in the ceilings of churches and cathedrals. They were donated by sailors or by shipbuilders as a means of saying thanks for deliverance for a safe voyage. I think that donating something so magnificent, so beautifully handmade just to say thank you for a safe voyage is such a powerful reminder of the almost complete absence of any safety associated with shipping back all those many hundreds of years ago. The type of ship is a galleon so this is shortly after Carracks came around. Carrack was shorter, fatter, tubbier, slower. These were beautiful, sleek, fast vessels. 
the hull is decorated by the, all of these wonderful people peering out at you. They're matched on the other side. There are some monks, a black guy there, perhaps a sailor, perhaps a passenger. There are some women playing the harp. And I love the remains of the masts. There are four masts in a bowsprit, and they've all snapped off, so you have to imagine it. Much taller, a much grander model, even though this is magnificent from what survives. In fact, in the model workshop here, they built a replica of what this would have looked like, and that is now in Stockholm Cathedral, so you can go and see it in its full glory. I'm walking around making a list of all the things that I want to film and there are so many of them but this is an absolute cracker. I simply love artefacts like this. It's a refugee boat. They, people used this at the end of the Second World War to flee the Baltic states, probably Estonia, and to get to Sweden. It's a, a, such a powerful symbol of fear but also hope and it feels like a very, very modern story. morning of day two. We did two models yesterday. It was great fun. We're all slightly jaded after yesterday. Uh, we've got two more to do today. One's a very special one and it's still in its case. So the first thing we've got to do is to go and get it out of its case. So let's go and find the Aeolus. It has to be the most beautiful ship model that I've ever seen. And it's a reminder that to do our special filming, the first thing we have to do is to get these models out of storage or many times they're on display. Uh, and it's a bit of a Bit of a careful process. Feels a bit like being in a, a jewel heist. I think the shiny material is going to make it incredibly difficult to film. The long voyage to the studio is nearly over. Fantastic, well done guys. The detail on this model is absolutely mind-blowing. It's gonna be fantastic with such high-quality lenses. It's just mind-blowing how good this is. It took 13 years to build this model. Built in 1884, came to a bit of a sticky end in 1927. And what makes it really special is that the guy who built it was the helmsman on the original ship for almost his whole working life. So he worked on the ship and then when he retired, he spent the next 13 years building this model. So it's a statement of love and commitment to your work, commitment to the maritime world. This ship was around the last final years of the great sailing ships, the clipper ships. It was a very interesting period where you've got sail, you also have steam. And these ships went faster than any sailing ship could and that speed posed all sorts of different challenges, different dangers, particularly in situations like fog. There was also an incredible amount of heat and pressure on board, so a very big danger of fire. And it was actually a fire on board that caused the end of this most magnificent ship. Hello and welcome to the smoking lounge of the Drottning Victoria, a rail ferry and it was built in the early years of the 20th century in Newcastle in England and then broken up in 1967 and when she was broken up they actually kept the entire smoking lounge and they've rebuilt it here. 
though it's perhaps a non-smoking lounge now. They've even got a model of the ship itself. She was a rail ferry, and you can see on this model of her here that there are two tracks and there's space for somewhere between 16 to 18 cars, some 165 meters, so a really significant thing. Famous because Vladimir Lenin was once a passenger on board, traveling back from Germany to Russia. It's a magnificent thing, and it really tells us all about the importance of railway infrastructure around the Baltic and how crucial these rail ferries were to keeping that entire infrastructure going. And rail ferries are still very important in the Baltic. They run regularly between Sweden and Denmark. This is not the only recreated interior that they have. In fact, there's another one, and it's from a much, much older ship. The one thing you can say about the Swedes is that they knew how to build a ship. They didn't mess around. This is the stern of the royal yacht of Gustav III. It was built in 1778, and it survived, and it's here. Now, it was designed by our old friend, Frederick Henrik F. Chapman, that very talented shipwright and ship designer. Uh, but unfortunately, this was not one of his best designs, and it was, sailed appallingly. It was nearly captured by the Russians in the Russo-Swedish War. It's wonderful that it's still here and that it still survived, but not only that, because they saved the interior. The actual interior is there, so we'll have a look. Wow. Just the most extraordinarily elaborate room. This was where Gustav III sat. He looked out of those windows. It's such a testament to the grandeur of Swedish sea power. Time to get the East Indiaman, and it's up here in the model workshop. We saw it earlier. This is a fascinating model. It's an East Indiaman. The model was made by a chap called Voldemar Konga. He was an Estonian refugee who came to Sweden along with many Estonians after the Second World War. These vessels are fascinating because they tell the story of global trade, of Sweden reaching out as far as it possibly can. So the Swedish East India Company was founded in 1731. This was a period when all things Chinese became super famous. Everyone was interested in not only Chinese goods and the tea that came across, but also Chinese philosophy and agriculture, and more importantly, Chinese technology. Absolutely love the details, especially the rigging. Every single one of these ropes has been made by hand. It really makes you think about how complex it would have been. I think particularly that's important for East Indiamen who didn't necessarily have the same size crews as a large naval warship. And I suspect that made their life a bit harder and a bit more dangerous. It's wonderful to see the Argentina, the first model we filmed yesterday morning is now safely back in its case for everyone to see. If only these models could speak, they'd be able to tell all of their friends what they've been through. And you need to make sure that you see the end results. They're on the Maritime Innovation page of the Lloyds Register Foundation. Some truly fantastic videos. It's been tough, it's been hard work, but really worthwhile to showcase these models as never before. <laughs>